on RN. This is Books and Arts Daily with Michael Cathcart. And you and I are meeting Graham Simpson, who's here with his new Laugh Out Loud, very funny novel. It's called The Rosie Effect, the sequel to The Rosie Project, which has sold 1.5 million books worldwide. Well, this this book feels to me as though it was written with great facility and joy by you. Was it or was it a grind? Absolutely. I love doing it, um, particularly the first draft. I'm a planner, so I've got a good idea of where I'm going with my first draft. So when I sit down to write, I'm writing with a certain amount of confidence. And, and certainly even more so with the second book, when I had a practice. I mean, life, you know, the, the Rosie Project was my first novel. And any time you do something for the first time, you're feeling your way, you're getting things wrong, you're going back and correcting them. The second time, I had a feel for what the job was about, and it was really a joy to write. So one of the challenges of writing a sequel is that on the one hand, you want to do something that you did last time that worked, but on the other hand, you've got to do something new so it doesn't feel like a rerun of the old book. How did you negotiate your way between those two conflicting imperatives? Well, the important thing was that I had Don Tillman, that Don Tillman is the centre of all of this. This is really a portrait of Don, and, and wherever Don goes – Comedy follows. Um, you know, the main thing is to be to be true to Don, not to force him to do anything he wouldn't do. Just set up the circumstances and and let it flow. In the first book, it was a standard romantic comedy in structure, um, and you know, the stakes were: will he get the girl? The stakes had to be at least as high. I felt in the second book, and I, I struggled for a long time to find a way into that. And the impending fatherhood turned out to be the way to go because the stakes are even higher. Um, he had nothing to lose the first time around. If he didn't get the girl, well, I guess you start again. Um, but here he's he's got the girl, he's got the baby on the way, and he's got every chance of losing this if he screws up. So that gave me a way in, and it gave me a chance to write about something different, not to write about um, the quest for a partner and you know, what, what compatibility comes down to, but to write about you know, a domestic comedy, if you like. Mm. You know, how, do, how do people work together? And Graham, why does she love him? She loves him because... He gives her consistency, he's reliable, he's totally loyal. Uh, when she was growing up, um, she didn't even know who her father was. Her mother died when she was young. She had a picture of people not being reliable. Don is nothing if not reliable. He's a guy with a, with a sense of humour. Um, he's a guy who does create comedy around him. He's a guy who challenges convention, and she regards herself as being a little bit unconventional. But, but the reason that their relationship works, or the reason the relationship formed in the first place is what Don would call joint projects. And I think that's, um, I think that's how a lot of um, relationships start and certainly how many of them survive and what they need to survive, that you're doing things, making plans together. How well do you know her? I know Rosie pretty well now. Um, there's, a bit of, there's a bit of me in Rosie. I mean, the, Rosie makes the bigger journey in the first book. Um, at the end of the book, people say, oh, Don's changed. No, he hasn't. Don at the end of the first book is awfully like Don at the beginning of the first book. When he's finally asking Rosie to marry him, he's totally unreconstructed. He's he's made attempts to change, but now he's dripping with water. He's wearing whatever he jogged to the university in, yeah. and he's, he's ranting. He's but, a total sitcom character in that regard. The essence of a sitcom character is they never learn. They come back next episode, and they're just the way they were last like week. Just like real people. <laughs> well, I suppose that's I, true. I, you know, I mean, the, the, the great conceit of many stories is that people change change in massive ways. And I think in real life, people don't change all that much. Um, Don, over over the course of the two books, does change somewhat. He works very hard at it, but he doesn't change in a fundamental massive way. But Rosie comes to accept Don. And that's the, the big change of mind or of heart that has to be made. And certainly in my own life, there have been people I've met who I found just a bit too weird, a bit too different to want to get too close to. And in time, I've, I've overcome that. I'm sure most of us have been down that path at some stage and you look back at yourself um, with a little bit of guilt sometimes that you uh, you didn't do that earlier. You know one thing I don't get about the story is why they need to work in a cocktail bar because he's at Columbia University which is ranked I look this up, it's ranked as the best paying college in the United States. A full professor rakes in over 200 thousand dollars a year so why are they why is she moonlight or not she's moonlighting why has she got this job in the cocktail bar well she's also studying an md so it's not only one of the best paid universities in the world it's also one of the most expensive universities to attend so rosie's a student doing a, a doctor of medicine so there would be a fairly big chunk coming out of their income for, for rosie's fees um and look on top of that there 
and plus, plus of course, rents in, in Williamsburg, where they've decided that they're going to they're going to live. Um, New York rents, but also there's this this thing of doing something together. And you know, the two of these two people are doing quite different things during the day. They come together, and in the evenings, they clearly enjoy making cocktails. They've got a routine going. It's the way they met or the way that they first bonded. Um, so they enjoy doing it. So Don tells us that he's happy when Rosie tells him the news. Just to help us get inside his head, what's happening in his head when he gets this news that we are pregnant? Well, it makes no sense. Obviously, his his buddy Dave's wife is pregnant, and by you know by that token, Rosie could say Dave is pregnant, and surely you'd never say Dave is pregnant. Secondly, it wasn't planned. So, you know, if you're going to have a baby, obviously you need to have a plan. You need to have a, a Gantt chart. You need to have discussed all this, weighed up the pros and cons. Research needs to be done, flow charts created. Well, the whole decision. I mean, would it be better to donate to a charity for children? You know, you need to balance all of these things up. So it's an irrational, um, it's an unexpected thing for, in Don's life. And Don does not deal well with the unexpected. He certainly doesn't. And he knows this about himself. He says <laughs> this, I, I hope you'll excuse me if I presume to read some of your prose, but he says, I was happy in the way that I would be happy if the captain of an aircraft in which I was travelling announced that he'd succeeded in restarting one engine after both had failed. Pleased that I would, <laughs> pleased that I would um, now probably survive, but shocked that the situation had arisen in the first place and expecting a thorough investigation into the circumstances. Yeah. So his good mate, Gene, who was a psychologist and a very naughty man, tells him that the best way to learn about kids is not from books, not to look at research, don't look at research papers. He says, go and watch kids playing. Let's give away that much of the book. What happens? Well, Don thinks that's probably good advice. He doesn't have a lot of experience with young children. So in New York City, he goes to the local playground and sets about taking some notes. Hang on, he puts on an overcoat first. Well, well, of course, he puts on an overcoat over his jogging costume because there's a 30% probability of rain forecast, yes. bicycle hat for hair protection, yes. and heads down to the local playground in his, in his raincoat and his, uh, in his hat. And, uh, and proceeds to take some notes. Uh, and a video. We'll start shooting a video because there's some <laughs> fascinating things going on with these kids. They're going back and forth from their parents. And he figures if that was shown in fast motion, you'd see some interesting patterns. So he's busy videoing that. And the kids move to the, and the parents move to the other end of the playground out of sight. And Don, of course, follows and continues. And eventually the, the police show up. And he doesn't deal with that, that cannily. He shows a lack of street. What do they call it? Street smarts, doesn't he? He, he, he says, um, I think he says, in retrospect, I may not have handled the situation well. <laughs> but he points out it was a situ an unfamiliar situation uh, with rule unexpected, with rules that he was not familiar with. What, what could you expect? And uh, when he gives what the cops would probably regard as a, as a certain amount of cheek and one of them hauls him to his feet, Don is not a man who likes to be touched. And he's also a man who's a fourth Dan in Aikido. So the cop goes goes flying in one direction and uh, the rest is pretty much what you'd expect. Yes, he ends up cuffed and in a cell. How much more can we reveal without spoiling it? He, ends up, it. Having, he, 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 he ends up having to undergo psychological evaluation. <laughs> so he's really in trouble now because the police sent him down to basically talk to a state shrink uh, whose name is um, Lydia, who insists on meeting Rosie. He, he, she wants to see the couple together. And Don can't bear to tell Rosie that he's made such a hash of things, but that's okay. His friend Sophie offers to help by coming along and impersonating <laughs> Rosie. That's so not a good idea. It's a comedy, and, and comedies are typically based on a certain amount of deception. And people will say, well, Don, Don is not one for deception. Don is very straightforward, no filter, and so on. But Don's very concerned that he might elevate Rosie's cortisol levels through stress, and that could have an effect on the unborn baby. So Don's done his research, and he can't afford to elevate Rosie's cortisol levels. So there's a so totally rational her. reason for lying. Don has always got a totally rational reason for whatever he does. He had a totally rational reason for going home with Rosie in the taxi in the first place. He's always got a rational reason, as most of us do. But also, what's interesting about him in this book is he's trying to learn the social signals by which other people interact. He knows he's not good at this stuff. It's not as if he's sailing through blithely unaware of how to behave in a social situation. He gets it that there's a kind of secret language which everyone else is privy to, but he's closed off from. So he's trying to systemise that as well, isn't he, really? He's trying to learn the syntax of... Well, socialising. Look, a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist read The Rosie Effect, which he feels is much stronger than The Rosie Project, and he said he found himself in tears 
to, about three quarters of the way through the book, um, and not of laughter because of the of the pain that Don has to go through, the effort he has to go through just to do what to other people comes very intuitively. There's a constant stress in his life of trying to work out what's going on. But, but okay, I mean, I can see why you would be in tears if you knew real people like this because there is a sort of terrible, bruised humanity to this character. But essentially, it is a screwball comedy. I mean, it reminds me of bringing up baby or his girl Friday. You've got two two characters who are essentially ill-matched, it would seem. Um, and then one of them starts to deceive the other for very good reasons, and it all goes terribly wrong. Absolutely. Uh, but but you know, I would say it's a screwball comedy. Comedy is certainly the first impression you have, but I'd like to think that it packs a little bit of an emotional punch as well, and maybe gives us something to think about. Um, you know, what it's like going through life as Don, um, what sort of... Um, some of our own mores in society, the way that we judge people, the, um, the standards we have. And to a certain extent, Don's an observational comedian. Don is, is examining the society around him and asking, why? Why do we do this? Why do you have to wear a jacket to a restaurant? Why is it so important? Now, as you told us, you wrote the original book as a screenplay, but no one wanted to make the film. I suppose now producers are beating a path to your door, are they? Well, people wanted to make the film. Nobody wanted to finance it. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. well. No one wanted to make it enough to put cash on the table. That's is there now right. cash on the table? Yes, there is. Um, Sony Pictures um, optioned the rights. Um, they paid me to write the first two drafts of the screenplay, which was great fun, given that I had it in my back pocket anyway. I'd, you know, so I did some, some so work on that. that was a good gig. That was a good gig. And now it's in development with Sony. So uh, we hope there'll be a film. Graham Simpson, congratulations. I love reading this book. Thanks very much, And I, you know, I wasn't quite sure I wanted to spend another whole episode, you know, with him again. But I really did. I love doing it. So congratulations. You've really pulled it off. It's called The Rosie Effect. It's published by text. And uh, you can hear our earlier conversation with Graham, which is all about The Rosie Project. We'll put a link to that on our website.